This conference will now be recorded. Okay, hello team. Um, my name is Anna um, McCorkadale. Um, difficult name to forget, but incredibly difficult name to spell. I'm a, a general pediatrician. Um, and I'm, I've nearly CCT'd. Um, the reason I think I was asked to give this talk is because I've got um, an interest in, well, I mean, a lot of things, a bit like a lot of general pediatricians, but I've got a lot of acute experience, some retrieval experience, and um, at cardiology, neonates, lots of other experiences, but the last year I've spent in pediatric emergency. And um, there, we've had one or two cases come through, and one which was particularly distressing for our team, and um, which is going to form the sort of um, framework around which I'm going to talk to you about paediatric drowning. I have definitely uh, framed this talk for people that are general paediatricians. It's not, it, it's, it doesn't go into depth in the intensive care issues. It's really for um, people that are general paediatricians or paediatricians that work in a &E, what we can do about paediatric drowning and strategies that we can try and put in place to make it um, less devastating, I suppose. So I'll try and keep the chat box open, but I think Harris is going to help me. If you've got questions along the way, please try and teach it like a, uh, treat it like a session um, that I would be giving you in person. Um, and I'll try and answer questions along the way. And there will be some sort of short breaks to ask you questions. So it'd be great if you could try and engage as much as possible. I know it's not entirely like being in the room, but as much as possible, it would be nice to try and feel a bit like that. So um, as long as everyone can hear me, then I will begin. So let's check. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a case review. And like I said, it's sort of some of the details have been changed, but it's, it's a, a framework around which I hope um, all of you can hang off the information that uh, I'm going to deliver you. We'll talk about the pre-hospital care, why that's important. We'll talk about drowning, the sort of what, why, who's of drowning, what prognostic factors you might pick up on in uh, when the, per the patient first arrives in emergency and, and why it might be useful as a general paediatrician to look out for those flags. Um, we're talking about the emergency and I say emergency plus management because I will go into a little bit of the intensive care management but not in great depth. Um, then we'll talk about the long-term prognosis of drowning, public health interventions and whether there's any evidence for early discharge for drowning patients. What I've tried to do as much as possible is give you useful evidence along the way. So evidence that will help you make decisions as pediatricians. So I've included those links uh, through the slides. And for anyone that's heard this before, that is a change from the previous times I've given it. Um, so the case is a 17 month old boy who's at a family gathering um, with lots of other children, the age range being between him, who was the youngest and 12, who was the oldest. And I think there was a total of six children. I could be wrong. This was at his uncle's house, so not his own house, um, and there was a pond in the back garden. He was noted by his mother to be missing, and mother was seven months pregnant at the time, noted to be missing from the living room area where most of the children were congregated playing games on the floor. Um, and he was found 10 minutes later face down in a pond, the, the pond in the back garden. Um, I, the neighbour uh, noticed sort of commotion of the family running out the house as the mother was screaming, as you would imagine, and called the London Ambulance Service, jumped over the fence and started doing CPR on the child. So the, the neighbour was uh, first aid trained. Um, when LES arrived, they confirmed cardiorespiratory arrest and started um, uh, life support. So they did two cycles of CPR and got ROSC without any drugs given. Um, so the, ambu the time from uh, the call to the ambulance arriving was around seven minutes. Um, they called HEMS because of the gravity of the situation and they arrived and intubated and ventilated this child on the scene, so in the back garden, and noted at the in intubation attempt that it was a soiled airway. So then we sort of we're going to just flip for a second to the emergency department. Um, so HEMS obviously will retrieve this child and bring them into us. Um, and in a in most uh, tertiary emergency centres, you will have the trauma team ready, providing you get a call in advance, which uh, is is almost universal with HEMS. And um, so we had a trauma team ready. And um, the child, as I said, was intubated and ventilated with a size four uh, ET tube, and it was quickly confirmed to be in position. And bilateral crackles were heard at the left base. Um, the cap refill was two seconds and there didn't there wasn't thought to be any cardiac compromise at that stage um, Hems had already given a fluid bolus but there was no reason on the primary survey to give a second one and um, from a deep perspective 
perspective, uh, they paralyse the child to intubate and ventilate, so um, difficult to assess D accurately, and that had not been uh, assessed on the, on the scene, although the patient had not been breathing when they got there. And from an exposure point of view, the temperature was 33 and the blood sugar a bit raised. Um, and you can see, you should be able to see in the corner of the screen, that was the first gas. So a mixed acidosis, um, largely metabolic with a high lactate and a very poor looking pH. So that's sort of the scene that we, uh, the scene at the, the scene at the scene, <laughs> and also then the patient as they presented to us in emergency. It'll come as no surprise to you that the child had ROS, they were intubated and ventilated, that this child would make it to intensive care. Um, so they were conventionally ventilated. Um, and at that top line, you can see those are the settings. So for anyone without intensive care um, uh, experience, and I don't know what the experience of the, of the people watching is, um, that's relatively high PEEP to have to use. So they were struggling a bit to move the air in and out of these lungs, but a relatively low oxygen requirement overall. So 27 on 10 are, are high settings, both for the uh, PIP and the, the PEEP. Um, the PIP being the top one and the PEEP being the bottom, but the oxygenation was okay. And SATs were maintained above a 92 with that oxygen requirement. The chest x-ray, which was done in resus, had changes. Um, so bilateral hazy changes, which were consistent with ARDS. And uh, intensive care uh, did all the things that you might expect intensive care to do. So they cited arterial and central venous lines. They used neuroprotective measures and very quickly, um, the child had, was noticed to be hyponatremic, so they'd had to commence a sodium infusion after corroborating that that was the correct uh, values. So I'm going to take you through the first few days of the intensive care admission, and then we'll focus on the bits around drowning that are relevant for us. Um, from day one to four, I think the team really were managing and responding to the different system-based challenges, and there were many. Um, there was an ongoing requirement for ventilation, if you look at the fourth point down, there was only one single episode of breathing above the ventilator. That was about 36 hours in. And that was the first time this child had been noted to breathe. Now, they were paralysed from the point HEMS got there to the point that they were um, transferred to intensive care. But beyond that, the paralysis was stopped. So the first time the child breathed was 36 hours. From a cardiac perspective, um, they were persistently tachycardic for the first all, all of those first four days in intensive care and quite a few additional tests were done on the heart including uh, cardiac enzymes and everything came back negative so there was a persistent tachycardia for which um, the intensive care team couldn't find an adequate cause the bp was quite fluctuant and fluctuant enough to be on and off inotropes quite frequently and um, so i think they came on and off inotropes three times within um, those first four days um, and they had electrolyte ongoing issues with electrolytes, not just the sodium. So I think here, uh, what what are we seeing from this case? I'm just asking for anyone to put in the chat. What what does that above that what, all that information? What does it tell you um, about this patient? Yeah, I've got someone writing an ischemic injury to the brain. It's likely, yeah, because we're not getting any sort of response from this patient. Autonomic dysfunction, yep, good. That's that's probably the reason for the, the two cardiac, uh, un irresolvable cardiac issues. Hemodynamic instability, yep. I think what we're talking about, so that's great. Um, all of those are correct. Um, and that's that's really what we're seeing with this patient. What we're talking about is, is multi-organ dysfunction, isn't it? So all of those individual things are correct, but together that means more than one system is involved. In fact, multiple, uh, which is why it's called multi, but more than just three, four, maybe even five systems involved here. Um, so... So it was multi-organ dysfunction, and that was probably by the end of day one, we could tell that, but certainly over the first four days, none of those organ systems really responded adequately to treatment. By day four, um, a CT had actually be, had been done um, right at the beginning, um, showing widespread uh, changes, and that was corroborated on day four by an MRI, and the brainstem would appear to be affected at this stage. Um, they had ongoing multi-organ failure, and um, on day six had brain, uh, day seven, sorry, had brainstem death testing, 
and care was redirected, possibly unsurprisingly, on day eight. Um, and unfortunately, it was a sad end to this case where um, there wasn't um, any onwards uh, life really in this world for this child. So that's a sad case. And for anyone here that might have been involved in, in that it was marginally changed, but in anyone that was involved, uh, the team did a great job. Um, but let's use that as a framework to think about um, what is drowning? What can we do about it? And what do we need to notice when people come into emergency? So I'm going to go through some public health awareness stuff. We'll do it from the UK, but I'm going to extrapolate it to globally because there's a lot of infra interesting um, global public health information around uh, drowning. Uh, we'll talk about risk groups, prognostic factors, um, and then we'll um, talk about acute management complications and the relevant evidence that links into these things. So first of all, what is drowning? I mean, I could have asked this question in the chat as well, but I'm sure most people would have an idea of what we're talking about. But now we're no longer talking about, uh, there's no longer near drowning or wet drowning or dry drowning, all those things that I've scored through, they've gone. We just talk about drowning. So that is any respiratory imp impairment following either submersion, so complete uh, covering, uh, or immersion, which is just partial uh, covering in liquids. So it doesn't have to be water, but of course, most of the time it would be water. So that's the, the um, specific definition of drowning. So if we have a look at the scale of the problem in the UK, this is across all age groups, and we will talk more specifically about paediatrics on the subsequent slides, but there are 400 fatalities from drowning annually. And the majority of these, in fact, probably all of them are avoidable. Um, so it's something that really public health interventions can have a big uh, impact on. There are 200 additional fatalities from suicide. These are mostly not in the age group that we are uh, dealing with as pediatricians. Um, and I actually will, will virtually not come back to those 200 additional fatalities because I think it's largely for us, the 400 that involve the pediatric population that are relevant to this teaching session. So 45% of these fit into the category of recreational. And what that means is that they were to do with something that uh, the, the child or the adults, the 400 includes adults, were doing that involved some sort of sport or activity that involved water. It doesn't have to be getting in the water. So it didn't have to be swimming or, um, I don't know, uh, water skiing. You could have been on a boat, so not intending to enter the water. Um, then what's, what I find surprising is um, if you look at this ne next statistic, of the people drowning annually in the UK, almost half, it's not far off, have no intention of ever entering the water. So these are people that are walking along waterways or that, like our boy, trip and fall into a pond or um, were meant to be uh, on a boat trip with their family. So it wasn't meant to be um, high risk swimming, jet skiing, anything like that, or open water swimming anything like that. It was no intention of entering the water. So that's quite high. I felt that was quite high. And it was it really struck me when I was looking at the statistics coming out of the Lifeguard Association. In, co in um, contrast to that, we're now in this country, and this has changed quite radically over the last 30 years. So in my lifetime, only 5% of our fatalities are from bathing, so from, from bathing children. And I think that's testimony to one of um, the big public health in, um, interventions around the time that uh, sleeping on the back and, and, and even before that actually came into effect, was that leaving children unattended in baths was absolutely no longer uh, the thing to do. Um, and actually, I read an article recently about uh, our, our, all of our friends, Jeremy Hunt, his sibling actually died from uh, being left in the bath by themselves at 11 months old, a uh, very capable sitting child, um, and he has a memory of this. So it's not uh, out with the course of, of a lot of our lifespans or not that far before where it wasn't that unusual to go and do something, to put dinner on or something like that. So the 5% that we are getting now, and these are statistics from 2016 to 2018, uh, that two year period, is a lot less than it used to be. And there's a certain underreporting of events. If you if you talk about drowning with the definition that I've just told you, um, obviously drowning fatalities are probably not underreported because they're all going to come to the attention of services, um, or they won't be very much underreported. But if you talk about drowning as an immersion uh, in liquid, or 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 submersion, 
um, with some compromise afterwards. Some people will be immersed in, in water, come up coughing and be short of breath for quite some time, but might not come to hospital. Or they, or they will be um, you know, swimming around in the sea and, and their parent will bring them back to shore on a surfboard or something. And um, these sort of things uh, are ne not necessarily reported. So there's probably more um, uh, compromise than we see in, in some of the statistics. If I extrapolate that now to worldwide, um, there are a near, a nearly 400,000 fatalities annually, and 90% of these are not in westernized countries. They're in low or middle income countries, and we'll, we'll move on to some pictures about why that might be the case. Um, and if you just compare that uh, to give you a sort of idea, it's one of the biggest public, I mean, current situation aside, one of the biggest public health killers, um, a public health sort of avoidable killers of, of, in the entire globe. And the World Health Organization have declared it a global emergency to, to address this. Um, the deaths from mal malnutrition are one and a half times that figure there, and the deaths from malaria two times. So it is a big problem in a global scale, probably not such a big problem um, in, in the context of why people die in this country if you're making a league table. And this is probably why all of these pictures were taken in the same country, which is Vietnam, which has got a lot of water. Um, and this family on the bottom left, they're an American family that are on holiday. Um, and they're being taken on a riverboat uh, down ha Halong Bay, um, and they're going to go to shop at one of the other riverboats, which it, they're not directly related, but could be the picture on the top right, um, which is children selling things from a riverboat, um, and the, the children in the bottom right are children going to school. Now, I think the obvious difference about this is the American family are wearing life jackets, for one, um, and the others are not. But the other big difference that's not seen specifically in the photos is the chance of children at the ages that these children are, which are not wholly dissimilar, having had swimming lessons by this age, is radically different depending on which country you grow up in. So it's probably not surprising, really, even with just those two really gross observations that there's a big difference in the scale of the problem in the UK or America or even Australia um, versus here. So let's talk about risk groups. Boys, how many boys have we got in here? Boys and men, I'm afraid. Um, in this country, 81% of our drowning fatalities are male. Um, and it, it, that is similar in every decade from zero to 10, 10 to 20, if you compare every decade, it only equalizes in the decade of 90 plus. So people over 90, that die from drowning, of which there are very few then it's more equal the proportions of men and women and that risk um, uh, context so that, that boys and men are more uh, prone to drowning for some reason is replicated worldwide so on a worldwide scale you're talking about 66 percent of people being male within our pediatric so that's across the whole age spectrum then we will bring it back to the pediatric population um, we have bimodal peaks. So again, within that decade of 10, 0 to 10 and 10 to 20, um, it's still more men. But in terms of the actual age, if you if you filter it down into years, um, the most deaths occur less than four. Um, so one to four and then between and then adolescent at the other end of the age spectrum. So 14, 15 to 17. And um, so we have a bimodal distribution and between the age of four and 14, you're less likely to die from drowning. Uh, but there are recurrences across all the age groups in paediatrics. Globally, more than 50% are under the age of 25 years. Um, and like I think I've alluded to before, the UK and westernized countries in general fare pretty well on the international ranking. And this is not something you want to be first on. So let's uh, talk about some prognostic factors. Um, and I'll try and make this, this bit a bit more interactive. Um, and I think that's when we sort of revert to our initial, our initial case and try and hang it all off that so it gives you something to remember, I hope. So let's start with poor prognostic factors. I'm circling them or, or boxing them in red. This is the summary of our initial case. Would anyone in the chat boxes like to comment on um, what of these things, what of all of these uh, statements made here and the blood gas would be um, an evidence-based poor prognostic factor. 
Okay, so there's a few coming up now. Acidosis, lactate. Okay. Yep. Lots of these. And a couple that we will come to. I'm going to address a, the couple that have got reasonable thought processes but are not evidence driven. And um, so what I'm going to circle are the ones where um, if you find this, you are less likely to, you, sorry, you are more likely to die. And your if you survive, your um, neurological recovery is less likely to be complete. And this is where evidence comes in. So some of these other things that people are putting in the chat might be poor prognostic factors, but there's no true evidence for them. So come back into that. So first, somebody did put this in the chat, a couple of people did, um, found after 10 minutes. So the longer you are submerged in water or liquid, the worse your prognosis is going to be. And um, 10 minutes is the um, time limit used to predict uh, you doing worse from both a more mortality and from a neurological recovery perspective. So that is evidence based. And the other thing is that they use 10 minutes, but actually when you use 10 minutes, really the, the counter starts when someone sees you. So probably every time interval is a little longer than what you see, but yes, 10 minutes, so that's one. Other people have put requiring ventilation and respiratory support was ongoing. So that was in these, this chat. Um, so requiring ventilation at any stage, even if you need it at the start, is um, does suggest poorer prognosis um, and ongoing respiratory support. So if you need respiratory support beyond um, three minutes, uh, that is a poor prognostic factor. And there's one more, there's only one more with evidence, which is the pH being less than 7.1. So pH of less than 7.1, an acidotic pH, um, is a poor prognostic factor. And that's actually with treatment. And by the time this gas was done, the child had been ventilated. They had had some oxygen. Um, so, so they'd had some treatment to try and reverse some of the respiratory compromise. And the pH still remained low. Um, so they are, the, they are the four. So all of the other things that people have put, we've got uh, lactate, which has not got evidence for it. We've got the type of water. Interesting, lots of people bring that up um, quite a lot. So fresh water versus salty water, uh, dirty water versus uh, swimming pool water. Um, there's not actually been any um, statistically proven evidence that you do worse. Um, the only proven uh, type of water that it's slightly better to drown in is a swimming pool. But the reason for that is nothing to do with the water. It's to do with the fact that there's probably a lifeguard. And um, so you're likely to be retrieved from the water quicker. So did we have anything else in that or should we move on? Acidosis, lactate, hypothermia. I'll come back to that. OK, so let's go on to the next one. It's not all bad. Let's have a look at some green stuff. Same four things. With this child, even though we know how badly this child did in the end, there are some features on this that are not all bad. Can anyone point out any better prognostic factors for him when he first arrived and we didn't know how he was going to go? Rosk, Rosk, yeah, Rosk at the scene, good. Rosk, Rosk, Rosk. Lots of ROSC. Yeah, the temperature, hypothermia, good. This is where we come to temperature. So, the other thing that's very important in pediatric arrests from all cause, um, but certainly in drowning, is BLS being given on the scene um, by a, a provider, any one provider, anyone even trying. And particularly in drowning, being able to give um, non just. Uh, uh, ventilation based BLS. So this neighbour was actually doing mouth to mouth. Um, in, the, in adult practice, first responders are now told just to give chest compressions. And if, if there's drowning, that is better than nothing. But actually, lo lots, of the, um, lots of the poor prognostic factors are around whether they get ventilatory support back. And the reason for their arrest is almost certainly going to be hypoxia. So getting the breathing going, which is something we're really used to in paediatrics, so giving five inflation breaths at, at neonates and um, five starter breaths for APLS, it's pretty, it's pretty part of our thing. We don't really do uh, much CPR without ventilation, but that's a good start. Um, the temperature being low, 
um, is a good thing. And the reason it's a good thing is not so much to do with morbidity, it's to do with, uh, to, to do with mortality, sorry, it's to do with morbidity. If you come in with a uh, slightly hypothermic, moderately hypothermic, not severely hypothermic, you're likely to do better from a neurological perspective if you recover. Um, so that is a good prognostic factor. Um, and the other one is the oxygenation. So he wasn't requiring a lot of oxygen, which suggests that he was able to gas exchange, at least to some degree. So the poorer prognostic factor would have been if the um, arterial PO2 is less than eight with treatment, okay? So he is above eight with treatment. So that was a better prognostic factor. ROSC is true. The reason I've not circled it in green is on the next slide. But it is true, if you get ROSC within a reasonable amount of time, that is a better prognostic factor. So these are the, the ones I've circled in amber, are things where we can't really tell. I'll talk about the temperature. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Um, I'll talk about the temperature um, and whether we should keep, the, the question that's come up on my screen is whether we should keep them cold and what's your target temperature in A&E. And I'll come to that in the A&E management, if that's okay. Um, so the other prognostic features here that we didn't, uh, that wouldn't have given us any information one way or the other, um, some people bring up whether you are uh, poorer from a prognosis point of view, if you are 17 months old. What do people think about that? Do you think it's more or less likely that you are going to suffer because you're 17 months old rather than say five or six or 10? Perhaps because no one mentioned it going through the poor and the good prognostic factors, it's not something that's come up. Um, less likely to be able to swim, yeah, sure. They are less likely to be able to swim. The reason, long term, you've probably got some better neuroplasticity, probably brain could be more effective. Okay, so we've got some different, different sorts of answers here coming through now. Maybe I just didn't give it long enough. Um, the answer is that, um, the reason I put it in yellow is because it doesn't give you information one way or another. What the information that 17 months old gives you that's sort of irrelevant by the time this child gets to A&E is they are more likely to drown in the first place. So they're in a risk category. So they're in part of our bimodal distribution. So they're under four. So the chance of them becoming submerged in water is higher than children of other ages. And that is probably something to do with the swimming ability, to do with their, um, so the age factor does, yes, the age factor makes the child more risky to enter the water or to become submerged in the first place. But once you have drowned, once you have had respiratory compromise from submersion in liquid, your age doesn't then make a difference. OK, so given that this one is 17 months old, if the same thing had happened to a six year old or a 10 year old, that doesn't change your prognosis. And um, it might change the chance of it having happened in the first place. And that may be to do with swimming ability. Freshwater, we've already discussed this, so um, the type of water doesn't have any impact on prognosis. Um, the ROSC I've put in amber, ROSC is a good thing, but because we had no idea of the time interval in this particular case, that's why I put it in an amber circle. But generally having ROSC on scene at less than 10 minutes is a good, is a good um, prognostic factor. And that we didn't have an accurate GCS. What we are looking for is a GCS above five to indicate that there's been um, well, a, a, sorry, if I if I invert that, a GCS less than five on the scene indicates a, pro, a bad prognosis, so that there's already been some neurological damage. So we didn't have an accurate GCS at all, but we did know this child wasn't breathing. So again, that was prognostically poor. So this is my summary slide for prognosis. Um, and uh, this is all uh, also in found in uh, the APLS manual, lots of it. Um, that the immersion time and the time to BLS is important in terms of prognosis, so it needs to be quick. Um, so having a first responder on the scene for drowning, but any for all cause um, cardiac arrest in children is important to your chance of recovery. Um, and your response to resuscitation, as people did put in the chat, um, if you get some respiratory effort within three minutes, the prognosis is better. Um, and if you get nothing after 40 minutes, then the chance of survival is really extremely poor. And that's not just neurological uh, recovery, that's survival at all. Um, and core temperature of 33 degrees or less increases survival and a better neurological recovery as well. Um, and we've talked, we just talked about GCS and there the blood gas uh, criteria. So a pH less than seven and a PO2 with treatment of less than eight. Um, 
all of this is pointing towards a functional hypoxic brain damage okay so that's what's going to increase your uh, the chance of a poor um a long term longer term outcome so let's talk about the acute management and i will come back to temperature um i've not forgotten that question it's still in front of me um Pre-hospital care is probably the biggest factor, as you've, if you've seen from some of this prognosis, in survival and recovery, and in some ways what we've got least control over um, in emergency, in, in our actual jobs, but we've got a lot of control over in, in, in our bigger, in our wider lives. Um, so people who uh, are supporters of um, uh, BLS being rolled out to the general public are, are, are great because you can have people in schools where there might be water um, uh, in you know in um, there's lifeguards now around public parks where there's water sometimes they are doing rounds so the park closest to me has got a paddling pool in the summer they've got a lifeguard that now walks up and down and um, who can do uh, basic life support so that sort of thing is really important and it's important for us to encourage that learning as well but it, it, it's not something we're in control of in our actual jobs. When these children arrive, that bit, that time's already passed. Minimizing the submersion at time um, and an APLS ABC approach. These are all the pre-hospital care things that make a big impact. In hospital, so um, we have to query cervical injury if the mechanism looks like it is um, of that degree. So older children who might have dived into the sea or something like that, we need to always remember to consider that as part of drowning. Um, we need to oxygenate and we probably will need a cuffed um, endotracheal tube um, to try and optimize the um, ventilation. Uh, for breathing, we need a protective lung strategy. And for that, I mean the same sort of strategies that they use in intensive care for ARDS. And that's because the picture um, in severe drownings is an ARDS picture in the lungs. So you're looking for usually volume driven criteria. Um, so aiming for uh, uh, four to six mils per kilo of tidal volume rather than really high tidal volumes or being pressure driven. Um, and for circulation, you give half fluids and you make uh, aim for an age appropriate map. So not wholly dissimilar to other children going to intensive care. So hypothermia, I said we'd come back to this. Um, should you keep them cold was the question. And that's not something that's specifically recommended. Um, if they come in with a temperature of less than 30 degrees, uh, active rewarming is necessary. And that is because anything uh, resuscitative, resuscitative wise will not work under that time, under that temperature. Between um, uh, 30 and 33 degrees, you might need a change in your resus drugs. If you need them, you need a change in dose. Um, and use some rewarming strategies. But the intention is not to rapidly rewarm them to um, a core temperature, which is normal. Once you get them above 33 degrees, there is no specific um, guidelines that suggest we should keep them cold. But after 33 degrees, you can basically chill out, if you excuse the pun, um, about trying to rewarm them any quicker. OK, so once they reach 33 degrees, you can allow them to warm up, but you don't need to actively warm fluids or, or anything else that they need. And um, you can allow them to just warm up more naturally. If they are not maintaining their own body temperature and it keeps fluctuating, it would be better to maintain that relatively consistently towards the 30, gradually up towards the 35 mark with a bear hug or something. In general, the children are more likely to be much colder rather than much warmer because they will, have, they will have been submerged in water and lost a lot of heat that way. So the answer to the question, should you keep them cold, is no, there's no specific guidelines. But once you are over 33 degrees and if they are responding to treatment, so you don't think they're not responsive because of hypothermia, you don't have to quickly rewarm them back up to normal temperature. I hope that uh, answers the question. Uh, neuroprotection is something that they do, uh, we do, um, and that's all in, uh, in an attempt to try and improve the long term neurological recovery or, or optimize it as much as possible. And seizure control is done if the child seizes, it's not done as a routine. So, antibiotics. I've been asked about this before. How would you decide on antibiotics in a child that drowns? And if someone wants to put, and this is fair, we'd just give them anyway. I wouldn't think that that was entirely out of keeping with what does happen. But anyone want to think about how would you decide whether to or whether not to give antibiotics? And I'll leave it a tiny bit longer because I think some things were coming through the chat before. <laughs> 
according to the type of motor. Soiled airway, yep. Yeah. Perhaps injuries, yep. Yeah. That's interesting, yep. Yeah. Circumstance, yep. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, so um, I'm still watching the chat, which is why my eyes probably keep flicking between my slides and that. Um, so if anyone wants to type anything else, then please feel free. Um, the answer to the antibiotics question is probably controversial, and there might be a little flurry in the chat group, but there's no evidence for prophylactic antibiotics at all. Um, no no um, good evidence for giving prophylactic antibiotics. And the reason I said right at the start, we might just do it anyway, is because I think that's probably what happens. Um, the soiled airway will definitely make people more likely to want to give antibiotics. But again, um, uh, there's not good evidence to suggest that that would uh, make any difference to this child's overall or specifically uh, respiratory recovery. Um, and the cases of children and adults, in fact, with uh, post-drowning pneumonias often end up growing often end up growing uh, bugs that are not covered by your standard antibiotics or um, I read a couple of cases this morning about fungal infections and we wouldn't routinely give antifungal prophylaxis um, but these are unusual cases these are just single case studies is there evidence that it causes worse outcomes no and that's why it still gets given so antibiotics are not going to not, are not going to make anything worse but they probably don't make it better and the guidelines if you if you read around this suggest that what you should be doing is when they get to intensive care um, you can uh, do a if, if they're in ventilated certainly if they're ventilated you do a bronchi bronchiovular lavage or you get sputum and you use your you you um uh, hone your antibiotics based on those cultures. Now obviously that means starting antibiotics 36, 48 hours into this process if they are positive and I just don't think that that's really what's done in this country. However that is what most guidelines um, when when they're using the studies that have been done on, on antibiotics um, suggest that we do. Uh, the type of water somebody's written further up um, that only comes into play when it is very dirty water and by that we're talking a swamp. So not just fresh versus salt water. Um, so if someone has become submerged in a swamp, um, the general consensus from uh, a few of the society I've, I've read, in, including um, the Society of Wilderness Medicine, would be to give antibiotics if it was swamp water. Um, but uh, otherwise, there's not evidence that it improves the outcome, but yes, um, there's no evidence that it makes it worse. And I think in general in this country, um, we would probably just give them anyway. Um, I think that might be um, different in countries where resources might be um, allocated slightly differently. Would you follow up? So the reason I put this slide in, and this is a relatively new slide, is for people in, in the general paediatrics domain, like myself, who might be seeing these children as a step down from intensive care, who've had a short stay on intensive care, or the ones that have been through a and &E and not required intensive care, but have had a bit of respiratory com compromise. Clearly, children who have had a bad drowning episode have gone to PICU and they've got early significant morbidity but are going to survive, will be followed up. I don't think that's rocket science. But what about if we consider a three-year-old who was fishing with his family on a holiday, camping holiday, fell into a lake from the boat and was submerged for four minutes. He got out, coughed a lot, then seemed to stop breathing, have a short respiratory arrest, but his father knew what to do. Um, so gave him some uh, some breaths, um, got them back to shore and brought them to a &E. They had um, ongoing tachypnea, uh, a small oxygen requirement, so required a ward admission. What would you do with this one? Would people follow up or would you think after 24 hours in hospital and coming off oxygen, that you wouldn't. And if people put when they might want to follow up as well, that would be interesting. If, if the answer is yes, you don't have to follow these up. If there was a 24 hour admission. Yeah, okay, fair enough. I'm gonna, if, if we get a couple, I'll read them out and then 
um, put up the evidence. Okay, so what I've got here if, um, is, is people saying uh, a bit about it being dependent on the time of uh, the length of admission. So most of these children, if you thought they needed admission, would be admitted for around 24 hours as a minimum or and until their symptoms resolve. Um, and then it's not unreasonable, really, if for the GP to re refer, specifically if you're thinking about recurrence of respiratory problems. I suppose what I'm driving at is, is there evidence for neurological follow-up for these children? And there is, um, or there is evidence. This is a, a study in the archives um, in 2018, where um, in Australia, which is a similar population to us, they looked at um, 97 drowning cases they had in a big children's hospital over that time, over, the, over a five year period. Um, and of those 97, they excluded people that clearly needed allied help, so speech and language or physio or whatever, when they were discharged from hospital, and they excluded anyone that had a long intensive care admission because they would be followed up anyway. They used ones that either had a very short intensive care admission because they were concerned they might need intervention and then had been discharged to the ward the next morning, or they looked at children who were just admitted to the ward for symptoms similar. That three-year-old in the lake is completely made up for my brain, but similar sorts of um, scenarios to that. And what they found was that 22% of these children did have late developmental difficulties. And by those, I mean, um, and at follow-up, they followed up, sorry, at three months, six months, then a year and 18 months. Um, and by six months, things like behavior changes, changes in sleep compared to their normal, poor concentration and some learning difficulties that hadn't been predicted prior to the event had started coming up. They also took out um, children that had already got developmental difficulties. So they were tr wholly looking at children who were uh, neurocognitively normal uh, prior to the episode. So it's nearly one in four do seem to have some late developmental difficulties. So then that begs the question, do you follow up? And I think, I think the answer is, that probably depends a little bit on your service. I think following up in uh, four or six weeks for neuro neurological things might not be useful for these children, um, but later follow-up might be, but it would depend on how that's arranged in your area, whether that would be something that you would flag on a discharge summary to the GP and say, we've asked the parents to come back to you, and then they could go to perhaps community services, community pediatrics, if those, those sort of problems are better handled in the community setting in your area but i guess what i'm saying is that there are there is a relatively high incidence even in children where the prognostic factors are good of some neurocognitive difficulties in this uh, that, that start to appear in the three to six months after the event so it's worth thinking about that when you discharge them and just being aware of it so it doesn't mean you you personally have to follow them up but just being aware that that might be something to um, think about and, and put into the GP's letter so that they can refer back to it if that's the way you handle it, or putting it into a neurological clinic if that's the way you handle it in your, um, a neurology clinic, sorry, if that's the way you handle it in your hospital. So then, basically prevention in drowning is better than cure. So we've talked a bit about um, the acute management. What are we gonna do in the UK? Is there, oh, sorry, is there anything that can be done to reduce the developmental difficulties at discharge? Um, once the um, child has gone through, so I'll go back to this slide just so I'm, I'm on the slide that refers to your question. Um, once the child has gone through the, um, uh, the drowning process and those prognostic factors are fixed, and they're really a lot of them are fixed, uh, the ones we have evidence for are fixed at the point they come to emergency, um, what all we can do is neuroprotect them through their stay um, until they start waking up. Um, if, if they are going to intensive care and make sure that any developmental difficulties are, um, uh, are identified as soon as possible. So probably the best thing you could do at discharge to answer your question is to uh, be aware or, or help the parents be aware that there might be these small issues and then if they pick up on them they can be addressed and they can be helped through them. Um, that's probably what's going to make the biggest difference. There isn't any specific things that will reduce the fact that this has happened to them. So long-term prevention in the UK, this is sort of new, um, a slightly new topic. Um, there's a national drowning prevention strategy, which is a, a lengthy document, but it's interesting reading if you're interested in this sort of thing, um, which has a 10-year plan between 2016, so it's already being rolled out. 
looking at reducing the accidental drownings, which is that 400 I, meant, uh, I mentioned at the start, by 50%. So reducing that down to 200. Um, and the way in which they are suggesting doing that is a lot of public health strategies, a lot of barriers around lakes, ponds, um, things that are in the public domain, and then some education around household ponds. If you live in a rented property, there are um, there is legislation around uh, the safety of water within that property and the grounds of that property. If you own your own property, there is no uh, you do not have to have a, pot, um, a fence around the pond, a net. There's no uh, legalities around that. Um, and I doubt that that will change in the next 10 years. However, um, what, what can change is people being aware that having those sort of things will reduce the chance of any children, particularly, but anyone accidentally entering that water body and becoming compromised. Um, other things were um, even along the Thames, so we're all London, I think most of us are London based, along the Thames there are areas of the Thames where people seem to be more likely to fall in and making sure that um, those areas have fences and appropriate guards. So things like that that they're looking at in this drowning prevention strategy. The other thing is swim safe, which is um, whether the swimming pool really is enough. So we talk about a bimodal, um, I'm talking about a bimodal distribution of mortality in drowning. Um, so we can start swimming lessons in the one to four year age group, but by the time the next peak happens in their adolescence, um, they have learned how to swim, or lots of them have, um, in a swimming pool. And so what's being suggested by RNLI is that um, certainly around coastal areas of the UK, they're rolling out a trial programme of getting adolescents involved in a sort of respect the water programme, where you do exciting things, actually. Well, I think they're exciting, but I quite like swimming, um, such as going out in a boat and being dropped safely, dropped into the ocean to see what that's like, to see what it feels like and to understand what techniques you could have to try and improve your ability to get out of such situations. Um, so it's interesting to think about these sort of other public health strategies, but I'm not going to dwell on them, but there is um, a big plan in the UK to try and improve that. And then this is the only time I'm going to mention those other suicide deaths is um, there is some collaboration going on with suicide prevention work to try and um, improve um, uh, awareness around water for, for people that are mental health risks. So um, the other thing I thought I'd add in um, was when can we discharge these children early, as in from a &E. So some children, we've talked about um, what we would do, we've talked about the children that go to intensive care, we've talked about follow-up, but actually some of you guys will be working in A&E, some of you might be A&E trainees, grid trainees, um, and and then what do, what do you do when a child that's three that's fallen off a boat but has been retrieved by his dad and has had um, a bit of, uh, you know, bit of mouth-to-mouth quickly and no cardiorespiratory compromise and then comes to you running about the department. Um, when can you reasonably discharge these children from emergency and is there any evidence around that? Because I thought that would be helpful because it might avoid um, some admissions, might avoid some overnight admissions which are unnecessary, but it also might help people feel safer about doing that sort of thing. So there is evidence, which is why I put it in partly, and it's come from the Amer from America, so similar population to our own, and it's in the American Journal of Med uh, Emergency Medicine in 2018. And they did a retrospective cohort study of 20 years. This is all age drowning, and it had about 200 patients in it, um, and only two patients developed respiratory compromise after presentation. So this is um, if they presented with completely normal sets of observations, there was only a 1% chance of some respiratory compromise happening following that. So by the time they get to your emergency department, this is across all ages in America, um, there was only a 1% chance of it happening later. Um, and that later was in the first hour. So of anyone that developed anything that required any sort of intervention, it was all happening in the, within that first hour in a, the emergency department. There was a second one done, which was a little bit um, at sort of uh, fine, finer point, it's a bit more us, it's all children. Um, and it was also a retrospective cohort study of five years, and but only children, so all under the age of 18. And they had 90 children in that study. And if at the point of um, admission to A&E, they had normal saturations and they had no what they called field intervention, which means nothing like requirement for respiratory support by an arriving medical team or uh, ventilation breath. So there was no res there was no respiratory arrest and no cardiorespiratory arrest, uh, so no compressions. Then they were 
none of those uh, children uh, with normal saturations and no field intervention, none of them developed respiratory compromise over the following 12 hours, or in fact at all from this event. Um, so I think that that tells you what you can do. Um, in a &E, if you come across a patient that has been drowned, um, and they look fine, and their observation at um, at triage were fine, including uh, uh, their observation at triage were fine. Uh, within your four hours, it's reasonably safe to discharge them. So I've got a question here: Is this including bystander BLS? And um, that is interesting question because it's very it's pivotal, isn't it? Um, it depends a little bit. So if they felt that the bystander BLS was both ventilation breaths and CPR, then, then no, you would keep those. That counted as a field intervention. If the bystander BLS was getting them out of the water and giving them back slaps and maybe opening their airway, then that didn't count. If they clearly, and you were very clear that they definitely needed some breath from somewhere else that was not themselves, that counted as a field intervention. I hope that answers that question. But if it was a parent slapping them on the back and they were coughing a lot and catching their breath, that didn't count. I hope that helps. So um, I'm coming to the end. Um, drowning is a significant cause of accidental child deaths. It is, it is significant in the UK, although not as significant as worldwide in terms of numbers. And a large proportion of these are really not intending to enter the water. So it's not something we can really even anticipate. Lots of water bodies where there's water sports and such like, there are lifeguards and that sort of thing. But if you weren't intending to enter the water, then they might not be there, such as this backyard. Prevention is key and modifying social and physical factors is possible in some in some ways. So it's not possible to modify what gender you are um, uh, in general terms. I mean, it's not possible to modify whether you are likely to be a risk, uh, have risky risk taking behaviours as an adolescent. Um, and it's probably not po and it's not possible to modify your age, but it is possible to modify whether big bodies of water have got appropriate uh, guards around them and back gardens. So it is possible to modify your own back garden. The out outcome and the prognosis is largely based on pre-hospital factors and long-term sequelae in children where something has had to happen on the field are common. And the children, I mean, the children that need admitting is common. And the follow-up route there will depend a bit on your local setup as to whether you go back via the GP and come in through general paediatrics if you have difficulties or whether you come in through community or whether your unit has the facility to get, um, to put them into a sort of neurological, neurodevelopmental clinic from the point of um, presentation or from the point of discharge rather from this sort of presentation. So I think that depends really on your local setup, but just to be aware that those sequelae are common if you've had to come into hospital. So that's the end. Um, I hope that was um, useful for everyone. Let, is there any other questions that are coming into the chat just now? Questions around drowning? So I've got so hang on. We've got in resuscitations after the child reaches 33 degrees, is there evidence about how long to continue CPR? Okay, so um after 40 minutes of no if you've got no ROSC and no respiratory effort, or I mean those two are sort of um, joined, aren't they? Um, after 40 minutes, the uh, the outcome is abysmal, um, and that is with a core temperature that has uh, you can't you can't say that if they're still extremely hypothermic. But if you are not getting any response to your treatments, you start rewarming that child up to normal. Once you reach between 33 and 35 degrees, and you have been going for 40 minutes, then there is not the evidence for any good for any outcome. Is, is, is incredibly poor. Um, in one study, if you'd been doing CPR for 40 minutes, there were no children that survived. So um, I think that there's your, that's 40 minutes. Um, are there expectations for beginning CPR for a child after drowning? So, okay, so this is a question around if a child comes into a &E having drowned, and I presume that this means having not had CPR on the scene, um, would you start CPR? And I think the answer to that has, I mean, for me, has to be yes. Um, I would expect that if a child was brought in having had no interventions, that you would start some sort of resuscitative effort, even if there'd been a, a reasonably 
uh, long, if there'd been nothing done, even if there'd been a, a reasonably long period, um, like 10 minutes or 15 minutes while they got there, I would find that um, a surprising situation to find myself in, but you can always be surprising things in medicine. If there'd been no resuscitative effort, I would start CPR um, and give the child a chance, uh, but be aware that the downtime was specific, was quite long, as for any other child where um, they needed resuscitation, but nothing had been done prior to arrival. Um, so I would begin CPR um, if they'd not had any before. Um, and any other questions? I think that's it. Is there any other questions coming through that I've missed on the way through? All in all, I think this is not very, across the country, not very co common. Um, uh, not very common for each individual unit I mean which is why it's probably helpful to share this as part of learning because when you come across it it's likely to be your first or maybe your second one if you're unlucky and um, because across the across the country as, as a whole it's a public health um, issue uh, but each individual A&E department are not going to see huge quantities of paediatric drowning they're slightly more common along the south coast of the UK um, but the uh, each individual and in London we don't see loads um, and, and then you're, you're looking at shift rotations as with everything. So you as an individual might not see this a lot. So I think that's probably why it's quite useful to help to, to share this as teaching rather than expect it just comes as part of your um, medical experience. So although I feel like I've been talking to myself for the last hour, I have had a lot of things through the chat. It's been very quiet because obviously everyone's muted deliberately. Um, but thank you for all coming. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording now.